Welcome to the Life Self Mastery Podcast, where we bring in entrepreneurs who have created online businesses and improved their lifestyles. Here's your host, Rohit Malhotra. Hi everyone, this is Rohit from Life Self Mastery and today I'm excited to have Zach Colius, who's the managing partner in Colius Capital, where he's investing into companies like Cruise Automation, Branch Metrics, Prosper Works, and more. Uh, Zach has also been an advisor to startups like HelloSign, Loom, StartGrid, and others, and was also a, a senior advisor of McKinsey. Zach was earlier the CEO of Trigit, which is an online advertising company which was acquired in 2015. Welcome to the show, Zach. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Right. So, so how did you get into, in, into uh, venture capital and investing? Oh, it was, uh, it was totally random. Um, so I've, I've always wanted to become a, you know, douchebag VC always aspired to, to sort of that, um, that lifestyle. It seems like, it seems like a, it seemed like a very cool, a cool gig, but, um, I was running a company called Trigit. Uh, we started it in 2005 and then we sold it in 2015. And at that point in time I had been, I was sort of lost. Like I didn't really have a, a job going forward with the company and I didn't really know what to do. And I sort of was wandering around trying to figure out what to do next. And um, one of the companies I had been advising was uh, a small startup at the time called Branch Metrics. Um, and they had, they'd, we'd helped them raise a seed round and they had gotten a bunch of traction. And so their series A came along and AngelList had just emerged at that point. And so I went over to them and was like, Hey, do you guys mind if I try out this new syndicate product and put up a little bit of your round? And they said, sure, go for it. So I, you know, wrote up a little memo and launched, this was a, the spring of 2015 um, or actually like maybe February 15 launched a syndicate and, you know, within 24 hours, the syndicate was, oversubscribed and, you know, boom, suddenly I was an investor. And um, that was sort of like an aha moment for me of like, oh, that's pretty cool. So that year while I, you know, was kind of lost in the wilderness, I did another four deals. And one of those was the cruise automation series A. And when that exit happened about a year later, you know, suddenly everyone thought I knew what I was doing and capital kind of came sloshing over and suddenly I was an investor, even though I didn't really know what I was doing at that point. Not that I do now, but I certainly know more than I did then. Um, and yeah, I've been, now it's been five years uh, full time and I raised the proper funds. I raised a, a vehicle that I can invest off, but I still run my syndicate and it's going really well. Interesting. So, uh, so you know, one of your big exits was cruise automation, which, which uh, uh, I think we got an exit after a year only. But, but yeah. did you get this strong signal when you when you looked into investing in that company? And uh, do do you think such sort of exits do happen uh, quite a while? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, that was a that was a billion dollar exit. Yeah. Twelve months after I made it. Uh, no. Uh, at the time, people were like dude, you have no idea how lucky you just got. And I, I was, I was sort of like, ah, I don't know, well, maybe. Uh, but in retrospect, yeah, I got, I got stupidly lucky there. Um, yeah, those are, those are, those are very, very, very rare. Um, I'm, uh, I'm very lucky. Got it. And, uh, you know, you've been an operator for 10 years uh, when, when you're running Triggered. What, what were the sort of learnings as an operator, which uh, you were able to apply f- uh, to investing? Oh, I mean, endless. I mean, you know, being an entrepreneur is, is one of the, it's one of the most amazing experiences you have is because you, you rise to whatever the levels of your own personal incompetence are. And, um, then you get the shit kicked out of you. So, you know, I like to, I like to say in a lot of ways, being an entrepreneur is sort of like being a gladiator. You know, you're, you're in the base of the Coliseum and, you know, everyone's terrified because they realize they're about to have their guts ripped out and they shove you out in the middle and you, you know, you grab a sword or a shield or whatever and you get out and you, and you literally, you go out in the middle of the ring and you fight and you sweat and you bleed until you exit or you die. Um, and the problem is that like, if you're good, you know, you, you, you solve problems quickly, then there's two more harder problems that come at you. You solve those, there's four more harder problems after that. You solve those and they send, you know, lions and tigers on chains and they shoot arrows at you. I mean, it's just this endless sort of like up-leveling 
that ev everything you solve takes you to something harder. And, and it's just like, it, it's, it teaches you so much about, you know, the game um, that, yeah, I, I don't think I could do my job at least not the way I do it. Um, if I hadn't had that experience, I mean, it was 10 years in a meat grinder, but I feel like it, it put me in a, it really taught me, it taught me lessons that I will never, ever, um, never forget. Got it. And you know, since you're running own fund and syndicate, uh, what are your thoughts on portfolio construction? Um, it's funny. I, uh, I was on Harry Stevens's podcast a while back and I, I said that I thought that portfolio construction was, was kind of overhyped in a lot of ways and, and people gave me a lot of grief for that. But, uh, but I, and now, you know, with this, you know, post COVID reset, we're going through not post COVID with the COVID reset we're going through, I'm actually seeing, you know, firsthand how lucky I was to have a very diverse portfolio. You know, I've got about 50 companies that I'm invested in and, you know, some of them have been, have been adversely impacted and some of them are being, you know, catching huge tailwinds and they're growing like crazy as a result of what's going on. Um, so I, I definitely think that having a diverse portfolio is, is incredibly valuable. Um, but I do think that there is a, there's a natural inherent conflict between sort of the optimal in portfolio construction and the reality of deal flow, which is that, you know, on any given day or any given week or month, I see a certain number of deals, high quality deals that one, I'm smart enough in that I actually can, can invest with, with some level of competence. And I have a pretty small circle of competence. So that's a pretty small subset of the stuff that comes in in general. Two, where the investment opportunity is actually good, like so it's priced correctly and sort of the company has the ability to be big enough. Um, three, where the entrepreneur is competent um, and the market is big enough. I mean, like that's a really, really narrow um, plane that, that, that of good opportunities. And so I think in a lot of times when people look at portfolio construction, they, they subordinate the good opportunities that they see to achieve the optimal portfolio where I think that's kind of backwards. I, I believe in like focusing on the good opportunities that I have and then hoping or doing the best I can to get a diverse portfolio as a result. But primarily I believe in when a unicorn walks in the front door or a future unicorn walks in the front door, I want to be able to invest in it. And then rather than saying, Oh, you look like you're a future unicorn, but you don't fit my portfolio construction. So therefore I'm not going to do this deal. Like good deals are just too rare. Right. And, and since you talked about COVID-19, you know, how's, how's it going to impact uh, venture capital and, you know, raising funds from VCs? Oh, I mean, it's been, it's been, it's been, very, very significant. And I think we're just in the very earliest innings of the impact. Um, I think, I think it, my, I wrote a piece on LinkedIn about this a little while ago, where one, the current venture market, unless you're in a category that's seen tailwinds or that people believe is going to see tailwinds. So let's say you're, you know, if you're, if you're a biotech company building vaccines, well, obviously you're going to get a bunch of money. Or if you're an at, you know, at home working company, obviously you're going to get a bunch of money. Education, you know, obviously going to be well-funded, but for most businesses that don't have obvious tailwinds from what's going on with COVID, they are, they're looking at headwinds and those headwinds are real, right? I mean, businesses are laying off staff. They're cutting back expenditures. They're pruning their subscriptions to SaaS software. They're shutting down unnecessary, you know, anything unnecessary. And that means a lot of these businesses that were doing really well a couple months ago are going to be they're not going to be growing anymore. And, you know, if you take a business that was growing at 300% a year and it goes flat in 2020, well, that valuation didn't go down 3x. That valuation went down much, much more than that. Um, and so I think a lot of these businesses need to, one, they need to figure out how to survive in a period where capital is going to be very scarce. And then if they want to get more capital, they have to be able to show that they can grow. And they have to grow in this environment, and which is challenging. Um, and so I think that's uh, that's the, that's what they have to do. And otherwise, you know, for all of the companies that I'm involved in, I've told them, look, you need to assume there will be no more capital for the next 24 months until you get to growth. So either get growth 
or assume no capital. But don't don't expect that if you have no growth, you're going to be able to to raise capital. Right. And, and you know, uh, you also wrote an article on LinkedIn about generation, you know, virtual. Uh, so uh, uh, do you think, you know, uh, uh, what would be the, op- what are your observation learning from seeing the world, you know, move into, into remote work uh, overnight? Well, you know, what, what yeah. challenges are going to be there and what behaviors are going to remain uh, after COVID? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think this is probably the biggest generational event of our lifetimes. You know, I was, I was in college when 9-11 happened. And um, I, I mean, I can remember that moment. And I remember how significant the effects of 9-11 were on the world that we lived in. And I think this is going to be an order of magnitude more significant. Um, you know, take, for instance, you know, remote work. You know, I think remote work was kind of like a, a nice sort of niche that, you know, some people did, some companies did, but it was not the primary way that people lived their lives. And it was viewed, it was culturally sort of considered to be somewhat, eh, who knows about that working from home? Are they actually working or not? Are they like, are they just playing? Like if there was a lot of skepticism around remote work, you know, now, you know, the vast majority of, of, of businesses now are, are forced to do remote work. And it's no longer a question of like, what do you think about remote work? It's like, how productive is your team in this new environment? And how do we make them more productive? And this is the number one goal and the number one objective of every team right now is like, how do you make your team more productive in this And the only thing that will result from that is that we will learn how to be more productive. We will build better tools. We will build better processes. Our culture is going to change as a result of what's going on right now. And when we come out of this, one, like, I don't know when that's going to be. You know, I'm sort of pessimistic about this. I think this might go on for a couple of years. But two, things will be very, very different. Um, And... uh, that I, I can't, I can't underestimate the level of changes and the, you know, the, 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 the driver for that piece I wrote about generation virtual gen V was like, I was thinking about my daughter, you know, normally I would take her to the park and she would play with her friends. I can't do that. And so now I'm basically having to fire up a zoom call for her to play with her friends over zoom. And I just realized like how, how powerful that is for her generation and for generations like her that, you know, used to um, live in one world and now they're getting used to a new normal. I mean, I, I can't, I, I'm, I'm convinced that this will probably be the biggest sort of the biggest thing in our lifetimes in terms of um, generational change. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, other than commercial real estate, you know, what, what are the sectors will be forever changed uh, because of the crisis? What do you think is, is, well, you know, which sectors will be the most impacted? Oh, I mean, everything. Um, Restaurants, you know, the right now everybody in America is ordering food online for delivery. And as a result, the businesses that support that are able to substantially invest in their capacity, in their their systems, their process, they're learning more because they have more orders coming through. When we come out of this, they're going to be that much more competitive versus going to a restaurant. You know, when, when a great meal can be delivered to your home at a competitive price, why go to a restaurant? Well, if restaurants start to see cyclical, 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 I don't know why I'm having trouble pronouncing cyclical, um, declines in, in their revenue, well, then they start to shrink. As soon as they start to shrink, there's less restaurants and, you know, it, it starts to feed in itself. Um, that's one category. Um, travel, obviously, I think it's going to, you know, no one's going to be excited about jumping on a plane, even if they do have the vaccine. Like it's, right. it, you're going to see definite declines in, 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 in travel, which means hotels, which means general tourism, which means, I mean, every single thing in travel is going to be affected. Live events, I mean, uh, yeah, everyone believes they're going to go to a concert, but like the thing is, is that if like 10% less people go to a concert, that concert goes from being profitable to being a net loss. Well, so that means you have to have smaller conference, uh, concerts. Well, if you have smaller concerts, then basically vendors and suppliers to those concerts don't make as much money. Like you get these sort of knock-on effects, which will be very significant across almost every category where humans needed to be in contact with each other. That's the inverse of like virtual, right? Like every single virtual experience is 
has grown by 10 or 100x, you know, in the last couple months. And as a result of that, they're going to accrue that additional revenue and also mind share and change culture in a virtual, to, to, us, to make virtual normal and to make in-person and reality abnormal. It's, it's, it's almost, it's bizarre. It's, we've, we've so dramatically accelerated the trends that are, that are going to be coming. Um, it's, it's pretty crazy, the effects. No, absolutely. And, uh, uh, but do you think, uh, you know, we see are still going to be open for, for business and uh, still, uh, you know, uh, new uh, companies are going to get funded f- uh, f- uh, from VC? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, my job is to invest in growth. And there are businesses that are going to identify the problems that we have today, the new problems of being stuck at home. I mean, people are at home and they're lonely and they're scared, they're hungry, they're bored, they need, they need things and they're happy to pay for those things if you can provide for them. But two, three months ago, those problems weren't there at the same level and the number and the problems were entirely different. So you have this totally new set of problems that have emerged and smart entrepreneurs are going to identify what those problems are and they're going to create solutions and they're going to call me up and be like, Zach, check it out. I just grew a thousand percent last month and the before, month before that I grew and I'm going to be like, here's all my money. Like I'll do that all day long. That's my job. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think entrepreneurs are going to discover how to solve the problems of this new normal. This, the COVID reset is just a new normal. They're going to discover solutions and they're going to build those solutions. And people like me are going to give them money to scale those solutions. Got it. And, uh, uh, you know, deal flow is really important for, for VCs. Now, how has, uh, you know, COVID-19 affected a deal flow for you? Yeah. So in the, in the short term, it went off a cliff. Um, you know, my, all of my deal flow comes from people who I know, um, you know, I, and those people, that incoming, you know, the, the emails that I've been getting have, have largely disappeared. And the reason for that is, is that if your business is doing pretty well right now, um, you're, you don't really want to go fundraise if you can avoid it because prices have gone off a cliff and much lower prices means, you know, why would you try to raise money right now? If your business is running out of capital, you're desperate. Well, the only people who are going to give you money are your insiders. Like getting a new investor to invest in a business is going, it's about to die is just doesn't happen. Um, And then we, it's still a little early for entrepreneurs to discover the new ideas, the new opportunities of this COVID reset. Um, They're doing it right now, but they're, they're right now they're all busy figuring out what it is that they want to build, figuring out who the customers are, figuring out how to build it before they basically go and try to raise money. So there was a, there's been a brief interlude of a couple months now where it's been deal flow has been very, very small, but I'm expecting, you know, we will see it. We will see it speed up pretty quickly here in the next few months as these new entrepreneurs emerge, their new ideas, and, and hopefully I can give them money. Got it. And uh, uh, do, do you think, uh, you know, uh, COVID would definitely, or, you know, auto valuations going forward, but, but, uh, you know, sh- uh, should VCs look at uh, bridge rounds and flat rounds and, uh, you know, should they look at investing in, in, in into such? Uh, and uh, what, what, what is your advice to founders uh, who have, uh, you know, uh, who go to look at altered valuations? Um, yeah. I mean, I love, I personally as an investor love bridge rounds and, and because there's, there's a there's an opportunity there to really identify businesses that have the potential to 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 grow and to do really interesting things at a much more reasonable price than when you know they're just growing like crazy you know when a business is a rocket ship it's pretty easy for them to raise money you know the the valuations tend to basically go up as much or more than the opportunity and so it's difficult to basically find a you know alpha as an investor. Whereas in a bridge round, um, I think there's a lot more alpha as a, as a VC. They're much more scary. They've got a lot more volatility. So you're much more likely to lose there. But um, I, I personally look for alpha as sort of, that's my job, right? Like if, yeah. if I was just investing in beta, then, you know, I, you could, you don't really need me to do what I do. Um, 
Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I look for those things, but you know, my advice to entrepreneurs is that like we've gone from a sort of seller's market of equity. Um, you know, if you're an entrepreneur two, three months ago, you know, you could get funded pretty easily. I mean, in my right. career in Silicon Valley, I've gone through a couple of these cycles now and I mean, I've never seen a period more frothy in terms of in early stage investing and in late stage investing than I did six months ago. I mean, any entrepreneur with any idea, regardless how good it was, was getting funded. Any business, regardless of how well it was doing, was continuing to raise capital. You know, I have, I have 50 companies in my portfolio. I still have not lost a single one of them. I've not, not lost a single dollar in there. And that's not because I'm smart. It's because yeah. there's so much capital chasing those businesses that new investors were constantly funding them, even if they should have died. Um, and that's, that's inverted. So we now, you know, six months ago, everyone got any money they needed. Now suddenly the money has, has largely become much, much harder to get. And when that inversion occurs, I think entrepreneurs will be unpleasantly surprised by how, they used to think they could get whatever they want. And now they're basically begging. Um, and, you know, having gone through this, you know, my last business, you know, we raised uh, a seed round right before Lehman collapsed. And, you know, we had discovered incredible product market fit and we had amazing growth. And it took me a year and a hundred meetings with VCs to raise my series A, even though we had, we had really truly found something amazing. Um, I, we're in a period like that now. It's uh, if you can avoid raising capital right now, you should. Um, it's rough. Right. And, uh, you know, interesting, you pointed about uh, the 2008 recession. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of younger founders uh, in who have not seen the recession, you know, the, how, how, how's the transition going to be from a peacetime CEO to wartime CEO? Are they, you know, you know what, what is it that they would need to do uh, to be a, a wartime CEO now? <laughs> um, well, I mean, so at the highest level, you need to think about, what is abundant now and what is scarce now. That's so, you know, for instance, uh, six months ago, peacetime, capital was abundant and now it's scarce. So should you basically throw a giant party for your whoever uh, and spend a bunch of money? No. Should you spend money on anything that you can avoid? No. Your capital is super scarce and you should treat it as like, as literally what it is, which is that's your oxygen because there's no, you can't assume that you can refill that tank uh, in six to 12 months. So you need to conserve it. Like it's, you know, absolutely the most amazing thing. Um, talent. So six months ago, talent was very scarce. You would do whatever you could to get talent. So hence, you know, all the perks and, and, and wonderfulness that basically had been thrown at talent. Um, well, every company in Silicon Valley or every, almost everyone has done some sort of layoffs. And even if they haven't announced layoffs, they've been basically getting rid of people. So talent, which used to be scarce, has become much less scarce. And so you no longer need to basically just give everything you have in order to get talent because it's, it's much more available. Um, time, uh, it, you know, six months ago, you, you had to worry about your competitors raising huge amounts of money and blasting into the opportunity and, you know, blowing, blowing your doors off because they moved faster than you did. Mm, now you can worry less about that because you now, if you, if you do that, if you basically blow money, you run out of that money, you're out of business, you know, whereas the more careful, more conservative, more patient sort of founders are going to be um, much more able to potentially survive and thrive in this, in this new reset. So, I mean, that's the highest level. I mean, there's, you know, we could spend many hours of talking about how to be a wartime CEO, but if you take those high level views and you kind of, and then you bring them all the way down to, you know, tactics and strategy, and then you basically bring it down to like, you know, just general mindset. It's, it's a very different world. Um, you, you just gotta get a reset. This is a full reset. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's important for the, for the founders to make sure that they survive. Uh, survival is, is really important. And, um, 
uh, you know you've been you've been uh, running your angel uh, uh, angel syndicate and uh, uh, do you think angel syndicates will will disrupt the you know the vc model the early stage vc uh, vcs uh, and and the uh, vc funds later on no no i i think it's i think angel syndicates are a superpower and i'm i think it provides access to the asset class uh in enabling investors who, you know, previously couldn't individually write the $25 to $50,000 check or didn't have access to those opportunities, it gives them access to startups and that as an asset class. And I think that's, you know, a pretty amazing place to invest. But no, I don't think it's going to disrupt the VC model. Um, it, will, it will become part of the sort of capital stack. But the things that VCs can provide in terms of assurance and the depth of capital that they have access to, a, a syndicate will, will never be able to replace. Now, you can, a syndicate can run alongside a VC and a syndicate can at certain rounds and in certain opportunities can replace the VC. But from a continuity and consistency perspective, a syndicate just isn't, isn't sufficient. I, I quickly want to do the top three. Uh, what's your favorite business book? Um, you know, I read business history voraciously. Like I've, if it's a business history book, that's, I've probably read it or tried to read it. Um, and, you know, the book I keep coming back to is Snowball. Um, I know that everyone likes it, so it's, it's kind of boring. I wish I had a more specific one, but it's the book about Warren Buffett because it's just the mindset that that guy brought to him and him and Charlie together, they brought to the business and the way they operationalized it is really inspiring for me. And so if I had to say favorite, that would be it. Um, you know, yeah, I could go on and on about business books. I love business books, but that one's probably my favorite. Right. And, you know, if you could go back in time when you started uh, investing and you started your fund, what is the one thing you would have focused on or done anything differently? You know, so I was, I wish I would have just done it earlier. Um, I was there at the very beginning and playing poker with, you know, the founders of Airbnb when it was, you know, just an idea, the founders of Dropbox, you know, I had a long argument with Travis when he started Uber, whether I would work or not. I told him he, it wasn't going to work and the taxi lobby was going to crush him. You know, I was, you know, obviously very right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but I wish if I had, if I had basically gotten into the game earlier, um, I would have learned more and gotten big, gotten that sort of that process spinning. I think that's, that's what I've learned now, you know, having been doing this for full time for five years is that I'm just learning every day. And if I had started that learning curve earlier, I think I would have been, it would have been good. Interesting. And, uh, but do you have any favorite online tools example, uh, Zoom, Slack? You know, I love LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn is probably one of the least appreciated tools on the internet. I mean, it's this amazing way to reach out and find the best people in the world about particular subjects. It's, it's this really powerful reference checking tool. Like whenever I meet any entrepreneur, I can go on LinkedIn and I can find, you know, 10 people who I know who knows that person. And I can do a background reference check that like within minutes, like, um, it, it enables me as a publishing platform and enables me to reach a lot of people. Like, yeah, if there's any tool I use LinkedIn. Uh, yeah. Like it's, it's the best tool on the internet as far as I'm concerned. And it's, it's, you know, it has a lot of problems obviously, but it's still really powerful. Yeah, I think, I think LinkedIn is, is how we, we got connected. So, uh, uh, you know, LinkedIn, is also a way I get connected to a lot of, a lot of VCs and, and, and the guests who come on the podcast. Uh, 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 so Zach, what, what is the best way people can reach out to you and know more about your syndicate and fund? Yeah. So the, the best way is, um, you can shoot me a message on LinkedIn. Um, I don't connect with people I don't know. So send me an in mail or you can find me on Twitter and shoot me a note there. Um, you know, I tend to, I, I get a lot of those, so I tend to filter them pretty aggressively. So, um, uh, no promises that I'll respond, but that's the best way to get a hold of me. I try to like, I try to keep my email box as, as manageable as possible. So I, I don't give out my email. Um, I wish I could, but it would, it, it gets overwhelmed so quickly. Got it. I will we'll put that in the show notes. Thank you, Zach, for coming over uh, to the show. I really enjoyed speaking to you. Yeah, you too. And uh, good luck with everything. I think you're, I think this is a, I think this is a good investment of your time. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thanks for listening to the Life Self Mastery Podcast, where we teach you how to start and grow your online business. For more information, visit Rohit's blog at www.lifeselfmastery.com.